Thanks everybody. Um, as Eddie said, I was at um, an over 50s genealogy event in the city hall there a couple months ago. I met a few characters, one of whom was Eddie, and so that the invitation came to be here tonight. So firstly, I'd just like to thank the Cork Genealogical Society for the invitation, and I'd also like to thank you all for coming along this evening to find a lovely evening out there. I've been in the garden sometimes this time of the evening, which uh, is nice thing to be not there as well. So anyway, um, my story. Um, firstly, I said I was in UCC and I retired from UCC there a few years ago. And like lots of people, I, is my voice okay? Yeah, yeah I really was going to get that began to take a bit of an interest. I an interest, but not a huge interest really in the family tree. Those who know everything. I'm a favourite they've been gone, and I never sort of tapped their brains, which is a common story. But I, I did take a bit of an interest when I had a bit of time on my hands, like lots of people do. Um, I come from a place called Tarbert in North Kerry, uh, way up in the Shannon Estuary, just over the border from County Limerick. Did you have know Tarbert at all? Yeah. There's a ferry called the Cross, the ferry, the Cabot's Flannery Car Ferry, is what it's known for. Uh, that's where I come from, and um, when I come, I'm going to do a little bit of research on the family tree and I discovered that um, all the surnames going back along um, are sort of everyday are the surnames of North Kerry and West Henry, with just one exception. Um, and the exception was um, up the top there, the surname McAvoy. My great grandmother was a Maccabi, and all the other names are sort of common names, in my own parish even, without exception, I think. My great grandmother was a Maccabi, a bit unusual for that part of the country, so I began to get into a bit interest in this. And uh, it had been written up briefly in the past that Target in particular, and a number of other parishes in North Kerry as well, um, were the locations of the transplantation of the clans of Leash always known as the seven sets of Leash, there are seven names there. When Leash was planted way back in history and uh, became known as Queen's County. Remember Queen's County you mentioned in your history? Yeah, it became Queen's County, it was planted. What was to be done with the original plants? Those that survived all the very battles that went on were shipped down to North Kerry, including the McAvoy's. So that gave me some of the history. Now I had another little angle to this as well. It so happens, like for coincidence, that my mother in law is Leash McAvoy. So that kind of gave put a little, I suppose, added a little bit of spice to the, the search. Now, I didn't do that much work on the family tree myself because there's cousins and, you know, it became, as it does, maybe a bit of a team effort. And my kind of used to that was quite slight. Um, but anyway, I got going on the family tree um, and I began to make a different interest on this transplantation. Uh, and two things that occurred to me. One is that this story about this transplantation was kind of disappearing, or almost disappeared. And it was a significant enough event in Irish history. The issue was the first ever plantation in Ireland by the English Tudors. Uh, along with Hoffman, it was known as King's County. Uh, so I began to take an interest in it. And the local people in Tarbert and the surrounding area, I thought, you know, this story was going to be a dead story. And I got going a bit on the history of it, we began to take an interest two or three years ago. And the result of the whole thing is that last autumn I published a book. Mainly that, you know, the story wouldn't die out, it would be kind of kept there. So uh, I'm amazed that I have a book like this. There I am. And the other thing I want to say straight away is that um, I'm not a genealogist, I'm not a historian, I'm just an amateur. And I suppose if you're foolish enough as an amateur to go and publish a book, I'm here and proof that you can actually do it anyway. So that's where I started out, and I just go through the story now. As I said, it started with my own family tree, the McAvoy's, and we had this, the, the, the surnames of the seven clans of Leash, known as the seven sets, wound up down in, in North Kerry. Now, just keep an eye on the time, we're quarter past eight, and I'll be finished by nine, and that'd be okay, Dave. Yeah. yeah, great, okay. And I'd see the two slides, I'd quite love them. So let's move on. Um, what I'll talk about briefly is the, the actual plantation of Leash, uh, what happened then? All these people were transplanted down to Kerry. And then, how did the land in Kerry become available? Uh, we had the Munster Plantation and Kerry part of that. And then, the only bit of sort of something close to genealogy, I suppose, is that 
I, I looked through you know, the usual kinds of sources and literature as best I could uh, to see how did these niche set surnames survive in North Kerry, maybe North Kerry, through the centuries down to the present day. Okay? Um, that's, I suppose, the genealogy of it, if you like. Would you call that genealogy? <coughs> uh, surname presence through, through generations and through the centuries. Uh, then I began to take quite a bit of interest on these rather remarkable people, the landlords. Patrick Crosby uh, was the man who organised the whole transplantation and was the landlord in Kerry, and his son, a remarkable character, who succeeded him, Sir Pierce Crosby. Uh, uh, and I, 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 the last two chapters of the book are about these two Crosbys. Now, I'll just mention this briefly at the end, and I'll wait until the end. But the name Crosby probably rings a bit of a different part, does it? Yeah. I'll come to that at the end, okay? Uh, as I said, the title I had was A Little Bit of Cork. A Little Bit of Cork was out towards the end, that's just one of the mentions there. Okay? Right. Um, now, I'll we'll start with Leash, the plantation. Uh, the people that mattered in terms of overall policy were the English monarchs, mainly Mary I and Elizabeth I. Uh, Mary was often referred to, did you nickname? Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. And Elizabeth I was the long reigning Elizabeth I. So during their period of trans transplantation, or the plantation of Leash occurred, and indeed the plantation of Munster as well. They were the Tudors, and then you had the Stuart monarchs that succeeded them, James I and Charles I. And they appointed what we used, what in old days were known as vice rights, but by their time were called the Lord Deputies, and this isn't the full list of them at all, right? And the key ones there were one or two key people. And I just have a little portrait of them. This was the key Lord Deputy who was there for a long time during the Leash Plantation, Sir Henry Sidney. And um, the resistance to plantation, and there was fierce resistance because they didn't fancy being thrown off their lands. Uh, the key people there were this man, Rory O'Moor. Leash is still referred to, if you were listening to matches in that radio, as O'Moor County. And they were the main set, they were the leading camp, if you like, and the others were sort of number twos. The other, the other six of them. Rory O'Moore, he was um, killed eventually in battle and he was succeeded by the man in the right, uh, only Mac Rory. Uh, uh, you wonder where these portraits came from now. They were um, sort of, in, they had a kind of a, an engraving type of thing at the time. And these were way back, okay? Uh, he's the man in the right and the man in the left is an extraordinary character, Father James Archer, a Jesuit. Uh, he was, um, from Kilkenny, and uh, there has been a, 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 a Jesus written about him as well. He was the papal legate in Ireland, and the Catholic and the Protestant thing was in full, you know, full battle was going on at the time as well. Uh, there were numerous attempts made to try to capture him. Uh, he got the reputation eventually of having supernatural power that he could walk in water, and in fact, he was never captured in the end. And you know this um, pilgrimage now of Santiago de Compostela? He'd be in, in Santiago, he, he eventually wound up being the, the head of the Irish College in Santiago. So he survived the whole thing, uh, even though he was very associated with resistance to the plantation. Okay, uh, the key happens in the plantation was that Rory O'Moore, leading the resistance, was killed, and his son, in 1578, his son was killed in 1600. There was, a, I won't read this, um, there was a bit of continued resistance up to 1606. This is a wonderful book, really, down at the bottom, I'll just give a reference there, um, on what happened in Linster and the plantations. And it said, just the last sentence, for the Almores and their vast, the fruits of the field from whom they bitter, and many of them were forcibly transplanted in June 1609 from their leash homeland to Tarbert County Kerry. That's where my story started to go, including, I suppose, my lot, McAvoy's. At least what I'm calling my lot anyway. Okay, and um, so that's how the whole thing started. That was the famous headquarters of um, the Amours in Leash, the Rock of Dunanese, just kind of north of Port Leash, just off the motorway. You can't quite see it from the motorway, but it's quite close actually. Okay, uh, and it's uh, kind of the main historic uh, site, I suppose, in County Leash. It stands out because Leash is very flat and it's that bit high anyway. Okay, um, now the idea of transplantation, the transplantation occurred in 1607, but the idea of transplantation was there 25 years or so earlier, and we needn't read through this because time is limited, if, if you don't mind. Uh, well, I kind of skip through this a bit, because I have about 50 slides, and I just keep going, okay? 
Uh, I'm just making the point that the, it mentions the brother of the chief of war, who, who the word Kerry is mentioned there, and there's even a barony within Kerry mentioned in 1584 where they had this idea of transplanting them. Uh, there's been a controversy, or it's too strong a word, I suppose, discussion in Kerry because I kind of raised some discussions as to whether or not some transplantations occurred 25 years before what we call the big transplantation, okay? And that hasn't been resolved to my knowledge anyway. You stir up things when you publish something as well. Um, this, the, the, the clans of the sects, I call them from now on, they didn't want to re leave their home and Nepal, of course, and they petitioned the Secretary of State in London, Cecil, who um, kind of ran the show for firstly Queen Elizabeth I and then James I. Um, uh, and they got basically, they got nowhere, okay? So, but they, they, they tried their best. Now, what happened there was actually horrific in terms of slaughter on both sides, and I'm not going to into that at all, okay? But, um, you know, we've been talking about ISIS now, or IS, or whatever we call them. What we found was worse. By any standards, it was worse. But we skip all that, keep it nice, okay? Uh, now, the key guy in organizing the transplantation was this chap, Patrick Crosby, and he became the landlord in Kerry, and he organized the whole thing. Now, he and his brother, John, younger brother, uh, who became the second Protestant Bishop Kerry, uh, said they were Crosby's gentry family from Great Crosby in Lancashire. It is now accepted by historians finally after about 400 years that they were total and utter impostors. They were, in fact, Macrossans who were the bars to the Amours. That's quite a monkey story going on here now. Uh, they set themselves up as these impostors, uh, partly accepted partly known to me what they were as well. Uh, I'll be saying later that this Patrick Cosby, you can nearly describe him as a double agent. His story has never been fully told, really, in my opinion. And was quite significant, and he was quite significant in Irish history, as it happens. Uh, so, uh, they, they had a bit of discussion and argument and so on about how the whole thing would be set up. But eventually, Cosby became their landlord in Kerry, and uh, uh, and, and that's, that's what eventually happened. The sects originally would prefer to be dealing directly with the monarch and paying rent to the monarch as tenants, but they then eventually Cosby became their landlord, and Cosby did very well out of the whole thing. Uh, now, uh, let's move on. There was a detailed agreement signed in 17 March 1607 in Laura Smith, which is just outside of Port Leach, and these were the seven leaders of the seven sects each of them, with the name Matt by there is one of them, who signed the agreement that they would accept transplantation down to Kerry. Okay? And I've got two things now about the agreement uh, that uh, were maybe relevant. Uh, Crosby would give six thousands of target of the ten thousands there to the six persons subscribed. These are the clan leaders. Uh, what's a thousand? A thousand in history in Ireland could be about roughly 200 acres of good land. So, I mean, these were clan leaders, so, you know, and they had to induce them to go as well, rather than start up the battle all over again, I suppose. Uh, I, I think it was the amount of land that could be ploughed with the technology of the time, which sometimes was a horse pulling a little plough by the tail, uh, that could be ploughed in 50 days. That was a plough land, I think. I've seen definitions that vary a little bit as well. Anybody enlighten you more? Okay. So they got, they, got, they got a good slice of good land, the tarp peculiarly for Kerry. Not Kerry is the good land, really, the tarp is good land. Okay? Mr. Crosby gave more a much better deal because he was the clan chief then, uh, and the, his Lord Bishop Kerry came in, so that was his younger brother John, and Lawrence was the number two clan, so the Moors got a good deal. And then the, the last thing, for the rest of the six sets, these were the followers now, rather than the clan leaders, he divided among the 42 plowlands which was a lot of land in the long leases, okay? And roughly speaking, they got about 10 parishes, the, the land of 10 parishes in North Kerry. Uh, so it was a lot of land really, and Crosby was the landlord over the whole lot of it, okay? Um, so that's what they got. Uh, now, there's a controversial thing at the end of the agreement, 1607, uh, but they listed 289 males, uh, including some of the leading sons of the, all male sons of the, the clan leaders are among them. That was a list there. It was thought up to fairly recently that these were the people who were transplanted, along with all the, you know, the, the, the 
their wives and partners and followers and so on. Uh, that now has been turned in its head recently, uh, not recently, 1952 was the last time I found anybody who wrote anything about this. But the man in 1952, uh, Dowling was his name, he was a Kildare actually, he, said, he debunked that theory and said these kids had nothing to do with transplantation as such. Some of them might have got to carry. He said this was the, the, the main standing army of the, of the resistance and uh, Trosley had them to dispose of them. And they were very, it was easy to dispose of them because there was loads of times around there looking for good fighting men. And these were very badly harmed. So, so he disposed of them. Some of them certainly made their way to carry, but more of them probably not. So in other words, I don't know and nobody knows how many were transplanted. But to, to, to accommodate uh, tenants on 10 parishes roughly at the time, you know, it was quite a lot, okay? Um, now we're back to Kerry, and I brought them to sleep along you know, just to show where they went. Anybody from Kerry? All Cork? Anybody who's not from Cork? But not from Kerry? Where? Limited Waterford, Tipperary. Limited Waterford, Tipperary. Poor old Kerry, I'm on my own. Okay, they were transplanted, tarped his way up there. Um, one lot of them were transplanted into a group of four parishes over here. Uh, and another lot of them, they stole in the hinterland. You know about the stole, the stole races and all that maybe. Uh, so you had four parishes over here, and you had six parishes over here. They stole and Trini in that. They were north of Trini, so and there was a whole belt in the middle of the land uh, of the North Kerry where other people had the land. And, the Crosby's land was over here, and Crosby's land was, was here, okay? So that those ten parishes. I have a more detailed map now, and you might uh, see some of the, the, the actual parishes. They were transplanted to parishes. Up here, there's Tarbert, Valley Longford, there's one here called My Van, okay? That kind of an area there, one called The Wall, those four parishes there. And the six parishes over here then were uh, Valley Duff, Causeway, Valley High, Artfert, Abbey Dorney, and Mixnam. Ah. Those names ring bell? Yeah. yeah, that's the area that they were transplanted to. Okay, those ten parishes. Okay, and um, now let's move on. How did this land in Kerry become available? Uh, no, uh, firstly, you had the plantation of Munster, which was absolutely horrific. You had the Elizabethan Desmond War in 1579 1583. In the four years, the turtle population of Munster was, was wiped out in just four years. Imagine it. We talk about IS. Mostly through, mainly through man made famine. You know, destroy, uh, destroy the way all the livestock, destroy the crops. People have no choice but they start to death. That was the main weapon of war in those days, as I read it. Okay? So that happened. The land became available. Crossbees got their hands on a lot of it. One of them, interestingly, was. The younger brother of Patrick Crosby, he became the Protestant Bishop of Kerry, having been a Catholic Macrossian, Barth the Moors. Okay, uh, a peculiar Protestant Bishop, the second Protestant Bishop of Kerry, in that he had 13 children, and nearly all of them were raised Catholics. It was an uncertain time, and I think this man was kind of hedging his best, because he was sure he was going to wind up on top. So, uh, and uh, anyway, he was married to an old uh, which is one of the clans which is another kind of a junior development, I suppose. And, um, and Crosby himself was married to no more. So here they were from Great Crosby, Protestants, but they were married into the two clans, which they came out of the clans anyway, which is finally accepted now. Uh, Crosby became a huge landowner in Kerry, but also in Leash, and they made Crosby Castle in Banyfin County Leash, which is now uh, the site of our, I'd say, our leading kind of seven-star hotel called Valley Fink Hotel. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, I was in it just recently because my wife's dick the rubber leaves, so I'd be up and down. It is, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a place I've never seen in the life of, that's all I'd say about it. Uh, Google it, Valley Fink Hotel, and you'll get an impression of it. Okay, so Crosby had all of this land in both Leash and Kerry. Okay, uh, now, this, just to get on to the bishop now, the younger brother and his wife, Uno Lawler, her sister married Hanora Lawler, married uh, a famous family in Kerry, uh, the Cantlins of Ballyhy Castle, and one of their descendants is Richard Cantlin, uh, who became advisor to King Henry the, uh, 
14 in France, and is still referred to as the father of, econ of, of, of economics. Now, I was an economist when I was in UCC. If I was still there, I'd expect to know more Brexit. Fortunately, I'm not, because I don't think anybody has a clue, but anyway, we leave it at that, okay? Uh, so, uh, he became uh, known as the father of economics, and uh, that's him there. Uh, that's the residence of the cantonments of Valley High Castle. Uh, it was burned down in the early 1920s because it was housing back in tanks in the old Valley and things were built up to that idea, so it got burned down. It's partially restored now on the site of Valley High uh, Golf Course. Do you know Valley High as a seaside resort? Yeah. Uh, and that's a fact on it. The father of modern, modern economics in the first year is to define the role of an entrepreneur. He became a multi multi millionaire himself. He put his economics into practice for his own benefit as well, um, obviously a very able individual. And he goes back to the laurels of um, Leach because his, you know, his, the, the, the Winifred, Una, Olar, and his sister, Honora, he goes back to those people. And the reason I put him this is I gave a talk a few weeks ago to Bob and Leach, and I knew there'd be a few laurels in the audience, and I thought I might say they had a famous ancestor. Right? Okay. Uh, now, uh, I guess the next piece now is the bit that I suppose gets a little bit close to some element of genealogy. Uh, the presence of the Leash Seps, and I kind of do it century by century up to the present time. In the early 1600s, Cosby didn't survive very long in, in Kerry when he died, and his will uh, is, is a public document. And uh, uh, he left everything to his only son, Pierce Cosby, apart from a third, which went to his his wife, Catherine Moore, in respect I have ever found her faithful, loving, and dutiful. It's not so lovely. This is written in 1610. And she was obviously, I'd say, entitled to a third share, which wasn't bad in those days. The law was not a lot worse up to fairly recently in Ireland, but it's changed. Uh, he gave a generous bequest to his daughter, Mary Catherine, the wife of Walter Spring. The Springs had just come into Ireland, into Kerry, as planters from England. And the spring, of course, is a famous name in Kerry, politics and sport and the whole lot. Down to the present day, we've had three generations of TDs, including at Hornishta. We've had rugby internationals and the whole lot. Uh, that would be their origins. And he also, just to prove that, you know, uh, the Moors were part and parcel of this, he uh, got his son, who was only 20 when he died, to, to, to have a special care of marrying my niece, Joan Moore, who was unmarried at the time. I really wanted her to be, I suppose, Married off to somebody wealthy, probably. Uh, now, this is the bit that interested me a bit. Put more of the will. I will freely forgive my own bond to, to Garrett Kelly, all such money as rents and arrears that are due upon him for the Lordship of Tarbert. He was his agent, one of the Kellys, one of the tanks in Tarbert. I've, I've had a lot of correspondence in the last few weeks, actually, with a guy in England, Stephen Smith is his name, who traces his ancestry to the O'Kellys, and he on the 400th anniversary with his son, walked the whole route that he thought it took for them to get from Leash to Kerry. Starting in Leash, and he looked at all maps to see what was the likely route, and he wound up down in each of the historic sites in Kerry. That was his summer holidays. Uh, uh, and then the bit that really interested me, I suppose, I don't like this, but all the corn, which Garrett and Garrett, <coughs> which is really a DB, or a D as they're known in Kerry, with a McAvoy and the rest sold in Tarbot, and presently restored them to them to every man his own portion, written in 1610. Now, I have no more evidence of McAvoy's and Tarbot until the tide of Plotman's around 1830, which is one of the ten farmer people, sorry. Uh, uh, is he one of my ancestors? I mean, I can't say it. But he was in Tarbert in 1610. My McAvoy is a very rare, rare name in Kerry. We're in Tarbert in 1830. Probably, I suppose, the best I can say. We've probably approved these things for certain. Uh, anyway, that's, that's the mention of those there in 1610. Uh, now, it's been suggested since I published the book, I've had quite a few people approach me in North Kerry and say, there was a wider transplantation than you're saying. There were others who were, in addition to the seven sets, who were also transplanted to Kerry, and people of these surnames in Kerry have come up to me and said, you forgot about us. We were transplanted too. And uh, that's just a list of the names of people that have approached me. I don't have much evidence. I have some evidence that some of them were, uh, and some of these people have done a lot of research themselves. And this um, sort of arose for me almost after the event of the publication, but you know, I just went to get in the for the head, and that was the, 
on ideas. And it just keeps the story going, I suppose, and extends it as it happens with everything like this. Um, now, uh, so many historians would say that transplantation was not a success, and many of the sets printed back to niche not beyond the subsequent decades. There's quite a bit about that, and some of them went back certainly, and some of them were slaughtered the minute they got back as well, because they certainly weren't wanted by the planters there, you know, coming back to grab the land back from us from them again. Uh, and uh, that did happen. And so some of them stayed in Kerry, some of them tried to get back, they were homesick, I suppose. Uh, and that's just a little bit of the history of it. And in County East, which I'm familiar with now, um, there is a Tarbell Bridge, and the people up there uh, who follow history say that name came back up from among those who came back up to the East from Tarbell County Kerry. Okay, it's just one little um, uh, bit of evidence, I suppose, of people going back. Now, uh, going on, where did they come up again in history? We had the Cattle Confederacy uprising in 1641. And they got quite a mention in that in Kerry. Uh, the O'Dorans, O'Dowlings, O'Lawlers, and O'Kellys, I don't know where this bit came from, unchanged Ethiopians from the bygone days when they played the pale, that's when they were up in Leash, the pale was up the Dublin area, uh, swooped down and said, Far to Lord Kerry's new castle, uh, and it, the cathedral in Arfert, with the stout old Colonel David Crosby, who was son of the bishop and a Protestant, uh, fell back to Ballingarry, uh, which is out in Kerry Head. And there was a huge standoff there, which lasted for a few years. And uh, one of the O'Kellys, who was part of the defence with Colonel Crosby, uh, actually lowered the drawbridge in the end and let in the attackers. Uh, but most of the bishop's uh, children was reared as, were reared as Catholics. I mentioned that, do you remember? And those who were leading the attack were actually uh, first cousins of the man who was defending. They were Catholic, he was Protestant. They recognized, of course, they moved as their own first cousin, so they spared his life, and he became fairly significant afterwards. He had all his lands restored to him uh, uh, in Kerry in the end. Quite a bit of it in Cromwell's own handwriting, as it happens. So, you know, he was on that side, uh, and his first cousins were on the other side. Uh, so, we had the, the, when you go back in history, you're probably looking at some of this from time to time, in the census, the so called census in 1660. The O'Dowlings were the main, it doesn't spell very well, uh, sort of was uh, from the seven cents that were common in North Kerry in the 16, in that census. Uh, now, the 1700s is a very difficult period in which to get much evidence of anything in this country. I mean, it's a dark and hidden history for those who weren't uh, land, uh, you know, land art class. They, they were all recorded at the time of the penal laws. So, you, don't, you know, it's hard to find very much on it, really. Uh, there's a good local historian in Kerry by the name of Martin Moore. He actually traces his history, as he says, back to the original or more uh, leaders who came down from the uh, uh, I know Martin. And uh, Martin says, my dad from Kerry, next to Tarver, was niece to Roger Moore in uh, this around the year 1700. And he was the grandson of the original uh, signatory of the agreement back, back in 1607. Okay? Uh, you get odd things like that that historians come up with. Now, the awards of my van are quite interesting from a few points of view. One of them, and the only one I mentioned, is that the father of, would you heard of Thomas Moore? Yeah. yeah, his father, John Moore, actually came from my van. So, Martin would uh, sort of claim, sent me earlier, connection there. Uh, I keep asking Martin to say, but he won't. Uh, Thomas Moore, uh, that's in there. So, he. Uh, Kerry people claimed them, or my van people, I suppose, particularly claimed them as one of their own. Uh, what songs? Any songs come to mind? The Harp of the Woods? I don't see uh, Yeah, the Harp of the Woods. The Minstrel Boy. Uh, often the Silly Night. Wonderful, really, they actually are. Uh, you don't hear them anymore, though, really, much. Uh, so he, he's uh, another descendant. So I had, we had. Um, Cantonate, the father of economics, and we had Thomas Moore, the Tarver, uh, not Tarver, the North Kerry people of Leach descent, two of them that made their names anyway, I suppose, in different ways. We come on to where we have decent records there that you, you probably would be quite familiar with now, those of you who are your own genealogists, of course. Um, uh, in the 1830s, we had the title document records, and uh, with the Griffith valuation in 1850, they match up fairly well. I just looked at it for North East Kerry, which is the four parishes in the northeastern part of Kerry. 
And uh, brief evaluation in for example, there was over 100 set surnames in the brief evaluation in those four parishes, uh, with all seven of the, the seven sets represented among the surnames, okay? Uh, now, there was an interesting book published in the early 1900s by a chap named King, and the last guy that did any research about the sets in Kerry was this man Dowling, I mentioned him earlier, and he did an article in a journal uh, in 1952, about five or six pages long, and he, one of the estimates he had that in the, at, at the brief evaluation time around the time of the Great Famine, there were about 5,000 persons in the whole of County Kerry uh, of each set surname. Now you can't say they all came from Leash either. You know, there were Kellys in Kerry, and there are Kellys in Kerry, who nothing whatsoever to do with Leash because, you know, there were other Kerry clans around Ireland. But quite a lot of them probably are from, uh, are of Leash origin, probably the bulk of them really. That's as much as one can say. I just keep using the word probable, and I can say no better than that. Uh, and uh, going back to the brief evaluation again, quite a lot of these um, sets really stayed in or around County Leash. They were supposed to be banished completely, and uh, when the transplantation occurred, uh, any of them that were found uh, were immediately hanged. Many women and children, or slaughtered, or some was where or another anyway, apparently. Uh, but half of these was woodland, and they knew the territory inside out. And they were intermarried with the surrounding counties, the abortions of Wicklow and all of that. So they probably didn't move too far away, some of them. I mean, you know, the times got easier, and the planters needed um, uh, laborers anyway, and the only ones they had were where the, the, the native buyers, we call them, uh, you know, they were able to come back and re-establish themselves. And so you get this proportion right down to the present day where roughly slightly more than double of the Leash set surnames occur in Leash compared with Kerry. Now my wife is interested in this because she's a Leash matrify in terms of her mother. Um, and she, like, I'm paying the same at home from the, this William matrify in Tarbert, who would have been the leader of the Leash matrifies. She insists that it's the Black Arts that was in Dr. Kerry, and the law abiding people were left, left back in the leash. And we haven't resolved that one, and we never will. But anyway, it's a bit of fun. After hot whiskey in the wintertime. Now, uh, going on to the 1900s, then we've come through the 1800s, and I talked about 5,000 in Kerry in total. This book by King, uh, which Dowling uh, did a lot of research on, in the early 1900s, there were about 2,500 people with the set surnames in Kerry. Uh, that's about half the number that was there in the brief evaluation of the time of the Great Famine, but that was the effects of the famine, you know, the population declined fairly drastically. Uh, and the particular families, uh, he Dowling went through them one by one, taken from King's great work. Uh, Moore's, Kelly's, Dowling's, you see the numbers of families. Enough, by and large, concentrated on the original land that Crosby had. Uh, become the landlord of way back in, in, in the early 1600s. Uh, so they hadn't moved very far. Uh, and poor Macquarie's down at the bottom, there were only four families left in the whole of County Kerry, and three of them were in Crosley lands. And that figure to the present day is still about, about right. It's not a, you know, it's, it's a very rare name in Kerry. Okay? Uh, now, uh, I did this little bit of work myself um, in Kerry to bring it right up to date. The best source I could get was the electoral, electoral register. It was 20 years ago I'd be using the phone book just to see the presence of certain names, but it's not the phone book isn't any good anymore because with mobile it's not, you know, there's only a fraction of the number of people in it. So the electoral register would quite good. It's a kind of a laborious exercise. We looked at about two um, each local area one by one. So I went through all the parishes of North Kerry that, the, you know, these 10 parishes I mentioned that they were originally transplanted to. And the total population in those 10 parishes is about 32,000. This is because of the present day figures. The Leash set surnames are about 900 of that, which is slightly under 3%. And that's kind of a consistent figure going back into the 1850s as well. About 3% of the population in these places were about uh, were, uh, the Leash sets. Um, is that higher loads? It's significant enough that you've 900, and I still reckon maybe about two and a half thousand in the whole of County Kerry, even though I haven't actually, you know, got down to uh, checking that one out. But that's my impression is that probably what it work out to be. I was doing the exercise sometime. But of course, we've had 400 years of intermarriage down there at this stage. So in reality, there's an awful lot of people in our Kerry, or a high proportion, who have some ancestor of the of the Leash sets. So it's carrying four parishes in that, so it's a little bit of the issue by the Okay? Now, another peculiar thing the six parishes that I mentioned there uh, to, to the, the northwest, Abidorney, 
big snap, after belly height. Mention the sport, you know, anything peculiar about them. Kerry is a footballing county, isn't it? They all, they, they are the dominant sport, totally isolated from any other hurling part of, 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 of the county, is hurling. That's their main interest. And they are the very six parishes that the Leash taught some 400 years ago and transplanted to. I tell there's no connection. I mean, they didn't bring their property, they didn't bring from Leash, I'm sure. But I mean, it's just a coincidence. Uh, is there anything more to it? I don't know. I met the Hall of Burhart, I think, there a few weeks ago, actually. Uh, you know, the commentator who's still going strong. And out of the blue, he started talking about this, and that the Leash people came down to Kerry, and it's where exactly they are hurling. Uh, that was kind of flabbergasted. We had a good chat about it. I never asked him how he knew that. Now, I don't know. I published an article in the Kerryman newspaper on this last, last September or so, after they launched the book. Maybe he was reading that, but I actually did mention that in the article, so maybe he picked it up there, but maybe he got it totally independently. I don't know. I, I don't know how to you make such a connection, you can't, but I'm just noting it as a coincidence, okay? Is it better the better land, yeah, yeah the this is good land. This is good land, that's a bit definite. And then the next part you get to those six parishes, I mean, you have, you know, North Cork, West Cork, West Limit, people will know Hurley. There are about 40 or 50 kilometers, I should say, now, from the next sort of significant Hurley area, totally isolated on their own, and uh, a good old show now and then for, for a very small population of Hurleys. Um, so that's that. Um, that takes that section, and now I will go on and just say a little bit about these Cosby's, uh, the father and son, and we'll finish around 9 o'clock. Okay? This part of Crosby, who became the big landlord, he claimed that he and his brother John came from Great Crosby in Lancashire. Uh, it's no more as except that they came from this place in County Leash, and that they had a castle there called uh, Crosby Castle, which was, that was part of history anyway, but that, that was their origins, and that's where the Macrosses were, and that they were the bars to the old moors. Uh, now, historians up to around 19. 20, until the turn of the 1900s, historians, and these are two famous Kerry historians, Smith, history of Kerry, and Cusick, uh, uh, history of Kerry as well, they took it without question that they were Crosby from Great Crosby and Lancashire. There was no argument about it. Now, they were the big landlords of North Kerry for about three, 300 years. Big, big landlords of the best land in Kerry, really. And if these people kept insisting that they were from Great Crosby, to take a brave person from to say you're not, that you're something else. So anyway, they took it without question. Uh, but by the turn of the century, and a very uh, fine book in two volumes written by Noah Hanlon, uh, which is the Leash book, uh, uh, called in that into total question, and some modern, uh, more modern people there, and I mentioned Darling again, said that they weren't, that they were um, Macrossans really from Leash. Uh, Brooks Theory is a lot of people, you know, when you look at you know, these types of people, the gentry, if you look at Burke's Peerage, they get mentioned there a lot. Burke's Peerage, roughly, before 1922, they're from uh, Lancashire. After 1922, they're, they're in process of leash. Uh, I think, you know, what's happening there really, I think people, historians, were totally objective, just went along with the politics of the time and what the state was saying. Okay? Uh, now, uh, Crosby rose to, he, he worked for the Dublin administration, the government, which was British, in the Pale, and he became deputy the Surveyor General, and he knew everything that was going on about the land in Ireland at the time of the plantations, which gave him a wonderful opportunity to grab an offer to the land himself, which he proceeded to do. Okay, um, uh, and basically he got a lot of it by deception. Uh, and I won't go into the detail of that, okay? Um, an interesting story in itself. And he wasn't alone. There's a little bit about cart land that he got. He procured for Thomas Oak all the lands of Finney Magone, of the Carthys of Calvary. That was McCarthy lands, and he had done to a lot of it. What he was doing really, he was letting the administration and Cecil in London claim that he had found a small amount of poor land, when in fact, in fact it was a large amount of good land, and uh, he was holding on to the balance himself. And the Bible was roughly 50 50, what he was allowing to be uh, put into the hands of the landlords, I suppose. Uh, and he was holding on to and, and he was so um, centrally important that he was able to get away with that, okay? Um, now, this is another little bit of uh, Crosby 
His great rival in Ireland was um, uh, Boyle, Richard Boyle, the first chairman of the park. You can come across him, I suppose. Uh, there's more castle and uh, abandoned and all of that. They were two great rivals. They were both massive land grabbers, really. That's basically what they were. And you just, uh, you know, we don't have time to go through them anymore. Uh, and uh, Crosby was given the job because he had a very senior position in Dublin. Uh, and Boyle was um, uh, uh, being off bother a bit of going through Boyle's papers, which made them deadly enemies to begin with. Uh, it's a bit like the Deputy Commissioner uh, the Commissioner and the Guards at the moment going through all these papers. Uh, uh, Crosby, uh, Boyle was accused by Crosby of concealing and so on, and, and that was coming from the Secretary of State Cecil in London. Uh, so there were deadly enemies. Uh, O'Hanlon uh, had some very nasty things to say about uh, Crosby uh, or McCrossan. Uh, when he published in 1914. Uh, there was always somebody prepared to do any amount of dirty work as informed spy or transplanter, and he amassed great wealth uh, and uh, talks about the, all the land he got in, in the Eastern Terry. So that was a very negative uh, comment about Crosby. And Carew, who was a big name in Irish history, President of Munster during the plantation period, said, said that Crosby, he knew of no man within the kingdom more willing to do Her Majesty's service than Crosby. Now, a recent paper that was unearthed by uh, a colleague uh, in the history department in UCC, your next colleague, I should say, uh, which was about 20 pages by one of the planter families in the Midlands by the name of Collier, written in 1600. Mostly writes about this fellow Crossan, and it says, it has been noted how dangerous it can be to suffer Crossan in frequentized cases in court so that he can lay a foundation for rebellion. Uh, rebellion. His thoughts were ever corrupt and foul, thinking to good himself and the Irish to the overthrow of the English. A totally opposite view of him. Now, he was very closely aligned with uh, uh, only Macrory O'Moore. And any time an O'Moore was in prison, because he was married to an O'Moore, I suppose, as well, he, he, he did everything to try to get them released from prison and to stop them from being hanged with death as well. So there's a question mark, like, which side was he actually on? And was all this a kind of a, an underhand scheme to enable the sects to actually survive somewhere, given that they, were, they had no hopes remaining in Leash, uh, and they wound up surviving in North Kerry? And was he part of a kind of a wider plot to achieve that? Uh, the answer is, I don't know whether that's the case. Uh, uh, I, I'm just, keeping, just putting it out there as an idea. Uh, now, the son, and I'll finish with him, Sir Pierce Cosby, a most extraordinary character, at uh, 20 years, 21 years of age, 1611, he inherited this vast amount of land in Kerry and also in Leash, and Crosby Castle in Leash. Uh, powerful people, this young fella, unmarried, powerful people tried to grab the land from him, uh, as they would. Uh, in 1616, he made this strange decision. I suppose it wasn't strange because he could get nowhere in Ireland because the people he would be appealing to were the people who were after his land. So he went to London, appealed to the English Privy Council, or the cabinet, if you could call it, to retain the lads. He got no here and there. He was jailed for eight days. After eight days, he was released from jail, brought to the court of King James I, and was appointed a cup holder, which is a position in, in the immediate entourage of the king. What went on? How did the fellow come out from jail uh, after eight days and wind up as a kind of a, uh, uh, as part of the court of the king? Uh, lots of tales about what was happening. He was a very, um, how would I put this? He was a very handsome young man, apparently. And old King James had very taste. And I won't say any more. Okay? <laughs> That's one theory, and I don't know the truth of it. I wasn't there in 1616. And he had all his Irish lands restored to him by royal decree. The next king, uh, Charles I, uh, in 1628, gave him a very senior position, really, a gentleman in the King's bedchamber. That sounds like a grand title, doesn't it? Uh, I suppose that the female equivalent with Queen Elizabeth II now is a... Do they still use the term lady in waiting, ladies in waiting? Do you remember that term? This was the male equivalent when you had a king, I suppose. Look after the personal needs of the king. Valet. Mm -hmm. Valet, that's exactly the kind of what I think it is, a valet. Uh, so he had that position, and what did they do? These gentlemen, well, one of the things I discovered they did, and I've got the Irish examples here, including a Corkwood, 
Mall at the bed chamber was paid four hundred pounds for procuring royal letters confirming native estates in our own country, which is Wicklow. Lord Treasurer advised Richard Boy, Earl of Cork, to make application to a bed chamber man who will ask three hundred pounds for his interposition. Now those are huge sums of money. I don't know if they had grown envelopes at the time. Uh, it's obviously what's what was going on, right left and centre. It was a period of the most enormous corruption. And as Guy has written a very good book by the name of Treadwell on all of this, that we talk about corruption in modern times, it doesn't touch what went on in more ancient times. When you get into it, okay? And there's a couple of examples of it of a kind of low interest and indeed crop interest. Uh, this was the man I spoke about, King James I. That's him, you know, you had to dress that guy, you said. Uh, which for a start, which was quite a job on its own, and that's what the big chamber man uh, had to do. Uh, and, uh, now, he became a military man at a certain point in his life, 1625, war broke out in Spain and France, uh, France and he became a hugely successful military man. And he, he had the only regiment in the whole of the British forces at the time, the English forces really, I suppose, that was Catholic. It, it, was, it was exclusively a Protestant. He uniquely was allowed to have a Catholic regiment. And it, it seems that the seven steps of each, including some of the Kerry ones, were part of his regiment. Okay? Uh, because he was still part of that family, I suppose. Well. He was, after all, uh, a descendant. His, his mother was a no more. Um, now, uh, he fought in Germany as well, uh, he wasn't called Germany at the time, he was a Swedish king, and he had a very successful and acknowledged military career. Um, he married, uh, firstly, a very prominent uh, North County Dublin family who were Catholics, Sarah, Sarah Barnwell. A peculiar thing about Patrick Cosby and Sir Pierce Cosby, throughout their lives, they both, it seems, remained Catholic, even though Bishop John was a Protestant in Kerry, the Protestant Bishop of this called the Hadona or Ferk, but really come to Kerry, I suppose, coming into the West Park. Um, but they remained Catholic, so he married for a Catholic family, uh, very closely linked to St. Oliver Plunkett, in fact, that particular family. Uh, his second marriage was extraordinary. He married Elizabeth, who was the wife of the first Earl of Castlehaven. After about 10 years, she became estranged. She had a big house in London on her own, and she became so enraged, enraged she burned down the house. Together with Lady, Lady This and Lady That, and other side, three houses were burned down uh, because he was off at war, I suppose, and wasn't um, staying at home. Uh, now, the first area of Catherine Hayden is interesting because he fought, uh, he was one of the deputies of Mount Joy at the Battle of Tansale, and what he wound up with after the Battle of Tansale, including lands in Castle Haven, the Odriscoll lands in Castle Haven, he wound up in Coke in Ireland with 200,000 acres. Imagine it. 200,000 acres, all the way from Castlehaven in West Cork up to the whole barony of Oma and Tyrone, which the great O'Neill had fled the flight of the Earls, and he got a huge amount of land up there, and all through the Midlands as well. Um, he got 200,000 acres, unmanageable, he wasn't much of a manager anyway. That's the first area of Castlehaven, we're nearly there. Um, with the second area of Castlehaven, who was um, Crosby's um, stepson, I suppose. Yeah, stepson. Uh, he, he, thinks he, had, he inherited this 200,000 acres and he uh, inherited a huge estate in England as well. His wife, in fact, should have been the successor of Queen Elizabeth I if they followed the will uh, of King Henry VIII, the man with all the wives. But in fact, in fact Queen Elizabeth I didn't like her and got James VI of Scotland to become James I in England. But this second America has paid was a total rape. And in 1631, following a sensational trial, he was executed for what I'm calling sexual depravity among the proof of servants. Do you want me to say I'm going to that a bit? <laughs> we won't. <laughs> and, uh, now, there's a strong connection here. This man, who they all think was very lucky to escape, John Anketil, he married Castle Haven's daughter Lucy, and they uh, lived in Newmarket County Park in a place called Anor, actually that's a name, it should be, not N. Uh, and funnily enough, with the first Earl of Castlehaven fight, fighting on the English side at the Battle of Kinsale, the son of theirs, the third Earl of Castlehaven, became a leading commander, including here in Cork, with a, a force of 8,000 uh, in the Catholic Confederacy against the English in just two generations. Uh, so it's funny the way people can uh, uh, change sides. And Pierce Crosby uh, received a lot of land in addition to what he had open for all. 
nearly there, and that's the man that was thanked for sexual depravity. I don't know if you can see anything peculiar about him. That's an image of him anyway. Uh, Crosby uh, became a member of Parliament in Ireland, uh, and he had a deadly enemy, the, the Lord Deputy, Thomas Wentworth, uh, and he, Crosby was bankrupted in jail by Wentworth, who had all the power, uh, and that was Wentworth, which is some piece of Irish Wolfhound, which is portrayed a lot. Uh, in the end, uh, Wentworth pursued Crosby. Crosby, because of his speech with the Royal Court, uh, when you had a Catholic Queen, with Charles II at the time, Henrietta Maria, for, which, to whom he was quite close, so he was able to survive, and um, he he um, he fled to France at the time he was bankrupted. Uh, there's the Queen Henrietta Maria and Charles II, uh, or Charles I rather. And, uh, he he, he uh, this is only about Winford and all uh, of of the problems that Crosby had with Winford. Uh, Winford eventually wound up being tried in London. The Lord Deputy and executed for treason, and one of the key witnesses against Whitford was his deadly enemy Crosby, who came back from France to give evidence. Crosby had all his lands in, in Ireland restored to him, uh, an extraordinary life. Um, so uh, he was, and came back and became a member of Parliament again, and the Privy Councillor of the Cabinet, if you like, of his Irish state estates returned to him. And then, in the final bit of his life, he joined the Catholic Confederacy against the English in Ireland against the English Protestant side, the Catholic Confederacy side, 1641-1646. Uh, he was against them first in Parliament because they thought this was a, a very bad uprising and they'd have to put it down. Uh, he was then appointed to committee to negotiate with them. He then got fed up with what was going on and he fled to France and he came back in 1643 importing arms into Dungarvan for the Confederacy against, against the, the, the English Protestant side, okay? Um, an extraordinary kind of life, really. Um, he uh, he was in the Confederation. In history, you remember Confederation of Kilkenny? He was at the heart of it. And uh, then, finally, in 1646, there was a split in the Confederacy. The leading side led by the Papal Nuncio uh, in prison, Crosby, and he died in prison. That's about the end of my story. Uh, and he, uh, every, everything in his will uh, suggests that he died a Catholic. Because it mentions the Franciscan Abbey in Kildare, his ghostly father, uh, uh, obviously a, a priest there, and, uh, and so he died a Catholic. I'm at the end, I think. Uh, oh, then not. Uh, this is a piece here about, uh, it was in the Irish Examiner in 2013. Thomas Crosby, a 15 year old from our third county, Kerry, which is where, you know, the Crosby that was their main base. Uh, joined the newspaper staff for not be a gifted newspaper man quickly ascending to the position of editor, written by Farmer Keane, uh, uh, who was working with the examiner, the son of John B. Keynes, actually. Um, I'm hoping to meet him in, in, in about two weeks' time. I don't know him, but um, I actually got an invite to Miss Old Writers Week. Have you heard of Miss Old Writers Week? I got an invite to that because they're rewarding the price of the book. No, Phil. <laughs> that was the nicest letter I got in a long time. So uh, it isn't so much you get a few bob or something, but it's just the whole kind of recognition of it. So uh, Conor Keane, I expect he will be there. Uh, his brother Billy Keane uh, owns the pub, the local pub down there. His name is fairly common here and there. Uh, if he's there, I meet him uh, because I met Tom Crosby of the Examiner here. We had a long chat about this. Uh, Tom Crosby says that there's still a missing link, and he's not too inclined to uh, fully accept that they go back to the Crosby's, these people. Their, their reputation carried for a couple of hundred years was very bad as landlords. Maybe he doesn't want to overplay that thing. Uh, we had we a great chat now, and we went into a lot of uh, the, 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 the history of Ireland over the last hundred years, and other things. And it was out of that he said, um, and I didn't mention it in the book at all, uh, as well, out of that he said, uh, maybe, you know, keep it okay. <laughs> Uh, and maybe, maybe there isn't, you know, maybe he has a point. Uh, and he had lots of papers about the Crosby's of Kerry, which many gave the game away. Why would he have them? Uh, that's the book. Uh, it's in the shops. I could talk about selling books as a self published author. I've learned a lot from a position of total ignorance. That's probably still. I've done an awful of things that, you know, were the wrong thing to do. But I enjoyed knowing them, so. And as a third person, it gave me a new lease of life, to be quite honest. Something to be doing.
I'm sure my wife is right to decide. <laughs> so that's the book. Um, it's online in a few places. Um, it's inside in you know, shops like Brussels and Albert Duncan Street, selling it at 20. If anybody wants it, it's available tonight. It's what's tenner? How's the tenner? I'll give a sign pop to anybody that wants it. Uh, and don't, I won't be worried if you don't want it. Uh, so I, I brought some copies along, and that's the end of my story. I always take my time, I need to not quite <laughs>